Paul's letter to the Philippian church on Sunday nights. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 1 through 11 this evening. If you would, bow with me. Lord, we come before you. We exalt your name. And we just pray tonight, Lord, that you would be with us as we continue to worship you through your word. We pray that you speak to us. That you, Father, would give us what we need. And that's understanding, Father, of your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit just unites us, Father, not only together, but with you. And Lord, might we be transformed by all that we hear. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Several years ago, I was at a conference, and I got to hear John Ortberg speak. He's a pastor. He is a, uh, an author. And he's told a story that I, I heard him, uh, I've actually read in some of his articles, but I also heard him talk about it live. And it's a pretty good story about his own life. He and his family are actually walking down at uh, a local fair. Uh, spending some time together, and they come across a mechanical bull. And he'd always wanted to ride a mechanical bull. And so he goes to the operator of the mechanical bull and says, I want to ride. And he says that the operator looks at my middle-aged body and then looks at me and says, are you sure? And at that moment, John Ortberg says that pride kicked in. That if he had to drag himself on that mechanical bull, he was getting on that bull. And I will tell you, I've been there. I get it. And so he gets on the mechanical bull. And the operator explains to him, he says, sir, this is how it works. There are 12 levels. There are 12 settings. I'm going to start you on the smallest, number one. And then we're going to work you up as we go, as you show that you're not going to kill yourself as you remain on the bull. And he says, do know this is not going to be easy, but we're going to work you through the settings as high as we can go before we think it's a danger to yourself. And John says, I got it. I'm good. And so he locked in. He, he held on to the bull. He got his hand underneath the rope. And he said that just as the operator said that the bull started moving slowly. And then it began to pick up speed. And then it became a little more erratic. And then it was moving him all the way back and forth, jerking and hurling him. He said it, it would have felt like to be in a train wreck if I'd ever been in a train wreck. And he said, I am very certain that my arms and legs were flailing about uncontrollably because they hurt for the next three days. And he said, but the big thing is I held on to the bull. He goes, even though it was difficult, even though I didn't think I was going to make it, I made it to the end of the ride. He said, when the ride ended, I was actually hanging on sideways, but I was still hanging on to the bull. And he goes, I felt really good about myself. And he said, I knew that when I finally got myself straight and I stood up, that not only that I had probably made it to level 9, level 10, maybe 11, now, that probably had to be the best ride out of the day. And because I just couldn't wait to go over to the operator because I knew that he was going to be impressed. And so I got up, and he says, I wink, and I pointed at the operator, and the operator was smiling and nodding his head. Like, I knew that he was validating everything that I did. He said, I walked over there, and I said, how did I do? And the operator said, much better than I thought you were ever going to do. You made it to level two, just like that kid in front of you who was 10 years old. And John Ortberg said that at that moment, his moment of glory became a moment of humility. And the worst thing about that was riding that bull cost him about three weeks with a physical therapist after that. And when he came to the end of the story, what he said is, he said, pride will get you into a lot of trouble, or humility will keep you safe. And I'll tell you, that that's a lot of wisdom in that statement. Pride gets us into a lot of trouble where humility will keep us exactly where we need to be. And the bottom line is this, is that we talk a lot about humility. We talk a lot about that in the church as well. And what we forget to realize is that humility is so important for the Christian believer because it's through humility that we actually are willing to submit to God's will for our life every day. It's through humility we're able to put the needs of others above ourselves. Humility is important. But what gets us in trouble is pride. Pride is what gets us in trouble. And pride is when we start looking to ourselves more than we start looking to God and start looking to others. Pride is the danger, and humility is what needs to be pursued. And that exactly is what Paul is talking about in our passage tonight. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, Paul encourages the Philippians to pursue humility by actually pursuing a deeper knowledge, a deeper fellowship, a deeper understanding of Jesus Christ. Tonight I want to show you two ways that we can actually pursue a deeper knowledge of Christ, that we can actually grow in our understanding of Christ, which will help us lead to humility. 
And then we're going to talk about how all this kind of applies to each of us tonight. And tonight, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, what this passage should encourage you to do is to actually spend time pursuing Christ, pursuing a deeper knowledge, a deeper fellowship with Him, and out of that will flow a natural humility from you. Because the more you know Jesus, the more you focus on Jesus, humility will be what pours out of you. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, you're not a believer, I encourage you to just kind of strap in and listen about how Christ changes, transforms anyone's life. And you can have the same transformation if you come to God through faith in Christ. What He's done in a believer's life is what He wants to do in your life. You just have to come to Him through faith in Jesus. So as we turn to our passage tonight, the first thing that we see in verse 1 is is Paul's command or, or Paul's encouragement to rejoice in the Lord. To rejoice in the Lord. Now as we look at this, Paul starts off with the word finally here. And as we see this word finally or further in some of our translations, we kind of look at that and think, well, maybe Paul is winding down uh, his uh, letter here. Or or when you start flipping through, you realize he's got a lot more left. So maybe he's like a long-winded Southern Baptist preacher that the word finally means nothing. He's got three more points to go. Truthfully here, the word finally here, a word further, actually in the, in the Greek New Testament language is loipon, and it can mean and for the rest. It, it can be a transitional word. It can mean finally, it can mean further, but it can also mean a summation. Now, Paul is taking everything that he's talking about, and he says, now let me tell you how I really want you to move on this, how I really want you to apply this. And this seems to be what he's doing here. Because Paul has really had a very intense conversation for the last several verses or the last several parts of this letter. He begins a very deep, really moving uh, uh, premise of moving through the Philippians of where he wants them to be. Keep in mind that Paul loves the Philippians. He loves this group, and in his love, he calls them out. Because we understand from this letter that there is some issues, there is some complaining, there is some grumbling, there is some disunity among the group, and they have lost their focus. They're not focusing on what is supposed to be primary. And what Paul is doing through the letter is calling them back. He's calling them back to a singular focus of what's most important. And we really see this, uh, this, this whole argument really being played out in the letter of Philippians. It begins really in chapter 1, verse 27, and it's moved through chapter 2, verse 30. As you remember, Paul starts off in chapter 1, verse 27. He says, hey, you Philippians need to act like citizens of heaven. You need to live like Christ is your king and, and heaven is your home and the gospel is your priority. And why would you make the gospel your priority? Because the gospel is the only thing that transforms lives. Nothing else does. Oh, well, how do we do this? How do we live as the gospel through our priority? It's through humility. You put God's glory above your own glory. You put the needs of others above your own. That's humility. And he says the, the person that really shows us that is Jesus. That Jesus did not take advantage of his divinity, but he actually put others above himself. That Jesus did not hold on to his privileges as a king. He actually took on the role as a slave to serve others. That Jesus actually chose to humble himself. And Paul says we need to have the same mindset. We need to choose to do the same things. Paul says we need to pursue this type of humility. And Paul says when it does, you will end up pursuing your salvation daily. And what that means is you are pursuing your fellowship with Christ every day, growing in your fellowship, following Him every day. And if you're following Him every day, you need to do that without grumbling, without complaining, without arguing. Because you're putting the gospel first. Paul says, oh, oh, by the way, when you do this, there's going to be difficulty. There's going to be sacrifices. He said, look at me, I'm in prison. He says, but the bottom line is you'll know that it's worth it because you'll know true joy. Joy that only comes from being in fellowship with your king and fellowship with others. And Paul says, listen, let me tell you, let me give you two examples of two guys who are actually doing this, who are pursuing humility for the gospel, Timothy and Epaphroditus. These are two normal guys that you know, that you've kind of hung out with. You know who these guys are. And honestly, if they can do it, Paul is saying, so can you. 
So as we see Paul's argument, we see Paul's discussion, Paul's calling all the way through with a group that he loves, the Philippians. He's not doing this in anger. He's doing this in love. And he's asking them that you need to get on the same page. You need to put God's glory. You need to put others above yourself. You need to rally around the gospel. The question is, how did they get in this position to begin with? How did they get off focus? How did they get off track? Well, how does any community get off focus? How does any community get off track? A lack of humility. We start thinking of ourselves more than we start thinking of God's glory. We start thinking of what we deserve more than we start thinking about the needs of others. When there's a lack of humility, what is most important begins to erode. I love the way C.S. Lewis describes humility. He says this, Humility does not mean you think less of yourself. It means you think of yourself less. Humility does not mean you think of yourself less. It, it, think, of yourself, think, of, think less of yourself. It means you think less. Think of yourself. I, I think I've messed that up three times. <laughs> Can I get a designated reader? Can I get the lefty to come in here? Humility does not mean you think less of yourself. It means you think of yourself less. Did I get it right that time? Okay. All right. For real love times, maybe I need to read it a few more times. Bottom line, what he's saying is very clearly, it's not that you demean yourself. It means you're not the most important thing in your mind. And see, what really happens when we start really thinking more of ourselves, thinking more highly of ourselves, when ourselves become really the focus of who we are, really at the essence of that, we've lost our focus on Jesus. That's really what it is. Because when you're focused on Jesus, things in your life, things in yourself, who you are, things around you really come into greater focus. So it's really not about focusing on others more or focusing on yourself less. It's really that if you just focus on Jesus, everything else falls into place. And this is what Paul is, means when he comes in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. What he's saying here is find your joy in Jesus. Let Jesus be the source of what brings joy to your life. He's talked a lot about joy in this letter. He's talked a lot about rejoicing in this letter. This is the first time that he connects it with Jesus Christ. He says your joy comes from Jesus. Jesus is to be your focus. Jesus is what you are to look for. He says, listen, this is not bad for me to talk about joy all the time. I don't mind talking about it all the time because in telling you where you need to find your joy, it's what's going to keep you safe. It's what's going to keep you focused. It's what's going to allow you to know what's most important. Because what Paul is going to get into, what he's going to describe is if you focus on Jesus and your joy is in Jesus, humility follows. Because if you think more about Christ, you will naturally think less of yourself. And thinking less of yourself is what leads to humility. It's a very simple thought process, and it makes a lot of sense. So what we see in chapter 2 through 11 is that Paul actually gives us two ways that we need to think more about Jesus. And as we think more about Jesus, thinking less of ourselves, which will naturally flow into humility. So in verses 2 through 7, we really see the first way that Paul says that we can actually think less of ourselves, think more about Jesus, and have humility. Now, humility actually is going to come when we let go of our achievements. When we stop holding on to our achievements and really focus more on Jesus than what we've done, than what we've acquired, than who we are, what we bring to the table, we think less of ourselves and more of him. So Paul starts off, when, when he goes into uh, verse 2, he, he rolls off very quickly, three staccato-like, very quick, very short commands, very short warnings. He says, beware of dogs, beware of evildoers, beware of the mutilation, or beware of the false circum, uh, circumcision, the, uh, beware of the concision. Who are these people that he just rips off real quick that we should know? Well, first off, let me just say this. If you want to know one passage that brought, brought me more pain, it is Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, because when it says, beware of dogs, anyone who owns a dog takes it personally, and they take it out on me. 
So let me just say this starting off. He's not talking about your beloved Fido. He's not talking about your beloved Fifi or whatever you got at your house that you love more than life itself, okay? He's not talking about your pets. Your dog is wonderful. Don't be aware of your dog. Love him, all right? Understand this from Paul's context. In Paul's context, dogs were not lovable pets. They are not your third or fourth child, the one that you love more than your own children. Who loves their dogs more than they love their kids? Let's be honest. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that holy hand. We all know it's true. Listen, it's easier. We know that. We love our dogs. I get it. But Paul's not talking in the back. During Paul's days, dogs were more like pack animals. They brought disease. They brought destruction. They ravaged wherever they went. That's what he's preferring to. So he says, beware these dogs. Who is he talking about? He's probably talking about those people who used to follow him around who would distort the gospel behind him, who would add into it or tear it apart or, or, or make it seem like something else. Beware of those who are coming in always bringing destruction as they come. Beware of evildoers. Who are these? More than likely we're thinking that these are the people who will follow along and say that they're adding something along to the gospel, meaning that you have to follow the law or, or you have to follow these rules or you have to have this certain lifestyle. Beware the mutilation. Beware the concision. Beware the false circumcision. This is actually kind of fun, uh, a little, little more difficult to get to. If you know the word circumcision or, or understand what it is in the New Testament language, the word circumcision is peritome. It means to cut around. If you know what circumcision is, you get the reference. The word that Paul uses here for mutilation, for false circumcision, for concision, is katatome, and it means to cut through. So you get the idea of the reference that he's making. We know that in the Old Testament, circumcision was a, an outside sign of an inward relationship with God. That's all it was. It was, a, it was an outside visible sign. But what Paul is referring to is people who said that you now had to do circumcision to actually have a relationship with God. It was required. So what are these three groups, these dogs, these evildoers, these mutilation, mutilators, concision, false circumcision? What do all three of these, these groups have in common? That a relationship with God was about achievement. It was about what you could do. It was about what you could earn. And in that brought pride because you could achieve it. Paul says, don't be like them. Don't think that this is connected to what you can do or what you can earn or what you can achieve or what you've accomplished. Paul says in verse 3, we are not like them. It's very interesting where that he uses the pronoun we. He brings himself into the same understanding of Philippians, the group that he loves. He says, we're not like that. We understand what the truth is. We have the circumcision. We have the true circumcision. What is Paul talking about? In the Old Testament, in Jeremiah 31, verses 33 through 34, God says, one day I'm going to circumcise their hearts. He sees in other places like Ezekiel 36, 26. Paul declares in Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through 29, and Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, that Jesus Christ has brought the circumcision of the heart, that he changes us from the inside out. What is Paul saying? He's saying we are the true circumcision because we have been transformed by Jesus Christ. We did not do an action. We did not do an achievement. We did not earn it. We did not add to it. We were changed through faith in Jesus Christ. And because of that, our worship, because of that, our service is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because of that, our boasting, our rejoicing, uh, um, our glory is found in Christ alone. Because of that, we have no confidence in the flesh. We have no confidence in what we can achieve. What we understand is we didn't do it. Jesus did it. And then Paul moves it even further. He goes, oh, by the way, if these folks have confidence in the flesh, if they think they can earn it, if they think they can deserve it, if they think they can achieve it, hey, I got them beat. Paul says, I am the gold medal winner. I am the blue ribbon holder. 
of all things achieved if I can earn righteousness. I can get it myself. In verses 4 through 6, he says, look at my pedigree, look at my resume, look at my qualifications. He says in verse 5 that, that he is from the stock of Israel. What does that mean? He's saying, listen, I was converted into this. I was born into it. You Gentiles got converted. I came into the family. I have a Jewish family. I have a Jewish background. He said, we're so Jewish, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I mean, I did it right. You want to talk about circumcision? He says, more than that, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm not from those northern tribes that rebelled against God. I was part of the southern group. I was part, you know, because the south is better. Amen. Can I get an amen from anybody? It's part of, there we go, that holy hand. He's part of the southern group. I was with Judah. We stayed in it a whole lot longer. We went a part of that rebellious northern kingdom. He says, you want to go further into it? I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. What does this mean? I speak the language. I know the law. I know all the customs. I wasn't one of these Gentile Hebrews. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I know the inside stuff. I know the secret, secret handshakes. He says, let's go even further. You want to talk about the law? I was trained as a Pharisee. I was a trainer of these people. I'm the one who interpreted the law. And if you want to know about zeal for the law, I persecuted the church and anyone else who went against it. I was passionate about it. And if you want to talk about earning righteousness, I was your guy. I was the man. I followed the law to the T. If anybody can earn it, if anybody has the degree for it, if anybody has the heritage for it, it's me. And then in verse 7, Paul says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. See, what he's saying is, it ain't earned. It's not deserved. It's not achieved. It's not about gold medals. It's not about classes. It's not about family. It's just about Jesus. And what he's saying is, you can't find pride in you because you didn't do anything. Jesus transforms. And that's Paul's point. As we look at the letter of Philippians, we understand there were some issues going on in the Philippian church. They were arguing, they were grumbling, and there seems to be some pride in the mix. And we really don't understand what the pride is about. It could be the fact that they were so really proud of their Roman heritage. Or it could be the fact that they really were in an economically high status, that they were well off. There could be some entitlement in here. And what Paul is really bringing out is this. Don't get caught up in everyone else. Don't think that you've achieved it. Don't think you've earned it. Don't think you're worthy of it. Because Christ alone transforms. Paul says our worship, our service is empowered by the Holy Spirit. He says our glory, our boasting, our rejoicing is found in Christ alone. And we have no confidence in what we can achieve. Because in everything we have, it means nothing next to Jesus Christ. See, Paul's point is this. we got to let go of what we think that we've earned or what we have achieved or what we have done. It doesn't matter how many doors we knock on. It doesn't matter how many classes we've attended. It doesn't matter how many committees we've served on. It doesn't matter how many years we've attended church because the bottom line is we've done nothing but only through the power of the transformation of Jesus Christ. It is never about us. It's about Jesus. So we got to let go of all of our awards and accolades and medals and understand that Christ is what changed us from the inside out. The focus can never be on us. It's got to be on the one who changed us. And if we focus on that, humility will flow right out. The second way that humility flows for our life, Paul will talk about, is that it flows from pursuing the knowledge of Christ. 
That, that if we pursue the knowledge of Christ, if we focus on the knowledge of Christ, we will think less of ourselves and think more of Jesus, which will lead to humility. So Paul, as he brings this in, in verses 8 through 11, he grabs a hold of what he's been talking about in verse 8, what he's been talking about in verse 7, and he starts talking about it in verse 8 again, but he's more tense in what he's saying. He goes off, not only these things that I have earned, not only these things are in my heritage, not only these things that I've been educated with, not only do I find those things worthless into knowing Christ more, I find all things worthless when it comes to knowing Christ more. <clears throat> now understand this, Paul is not saying that education is bad, that family is bad, that heritage is bad, that tradition is bad, or whatever else we've been brought up in. What he's just saying is, when it comes to knowing Jesus Christ, it's less. Once again, these things aren't bad, but they're not greater and they're not equal to knowing Christ. So what Paul is saying is what the true desire is, what the true thing we need to do is to pursue Christ, to pursue him more. Listen again what he says in verse 8. Yet indeed I also count all things laws for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. He's just saying this. He says when I compare them to the glory of Jesus, it's just not worth a whole lot. Not that they're bad. They're just not worth a whole lot. And then he points a little bit more. He says, my desire, what I'm running after, is to gain more of Christ, to be found in him. Now, understand this. He's not saying I need more Jesus. There are many days I feel like I need more Jesus, but the reality is this, Christian, we all get the same amount of Jesus, right? We, we, there, there, there's not like you get different amounts of Jesus. He doesn't come in a value pack. We all get the same amount. So what is he been saying that he wants to gain Christ? He wants to be found more in him. What he's saying is this, is that I want to know more about him. I want to turn over more of my life to him. I want to give him control of all things. I want him to know, well, I want to know what he feels about this area and that area. I want to submit to him in every area of his life. This is what it means to gain more Jesus. It actually means to give him control of every aspect of our life. Paul's saying, that's what I want. That's what I'm running after. That's my desire, to give him more of my life, that I know his thoughts, his desires, his will. That's what I'm pursuing. That's what he means by the knowledge of Christ, growing, gaining, being found in Christ. And Christian, we got to ask, is that our desire too? I mean, is that really what we're running after? Is that our greatest desire? To give him every area of our life for him to be in control. Do you want him to be in control of your family so you'll know what he wants for your family? Do you want him to be a part and in control of your job so he can take your job to be whatever it is he wants it to be? Do you want him to be in control of your daily life, your personal life, so he can take all of you? And is that our desire? What do we really want? So that's what Paul is saying. I just want more of him in control and less of me. That's what I'm running after. Because what Paul is saying is that when Jesus is in charge, it changes everything. But Paul doesn't stop there. He gives us an understanding in verses 9 through 11. He says, listen, let me just tell you what I've learned so far. Let me just tell you how Jesus impacted the way I see things, how he's impacted the way that I actually perceive the things around me. And what he talks about actually is salvation. Let me show you, let me talk to you about the way that Jesus has impacted the way that I see my salvation, my rescue from my separation from God through faith in Christ. You guys remember a couple weeks ago we talked about the three aspects of salvation? Anybody remember that? Justification, sanctification, and glorification. We, we had that little shallow dive in the theology, and you were like, praise God, let's not go there again. But we got to go there again, I'm sorry. 
We're going to hit it again. Because this is what Paul talks about. He actually says, let me tell you how a knowledge of Christ, how a deeper understanding of Him has changed the way I see justification, sanctification, and glorification. That's what he talks about, verses 9, 10, and 11. He says, let me, let me, let me show you what it's, what it's done. In verse 9, he's talking about justification. And remember that the justification is that one-time event that we come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, and in that we are saved from the penalty of sin, saved from eternal separation from God. It's where God declares us right. It's where God declares us just, that, that we are right with him forever because of Jesus. Remember, it's a one-time event. We said it was, we'll say it's like this altar right here. It's, it's, it's one time, we can hit it, we see it, it's right there. Listen to what he says about his justification. He said, this is, this is what I understand now by knowing more of Jesus. Look what he says in verse 9. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. What is he saying? He's saying, this is what I understand. That God didn't save me because I was righteous. That God didn't rescue me because I was good. That when I understood more about Jesus Christ, when I, when I understood it from him and knowing more of him, what I understood was is that Jesus gave me his righteousness in faith. Now, when God sees me, he doesn't see my pedigree. He doesn't see my background. He doesn't see my accomplishments. When I come to through faith in Jesus Christ, he sees Jesus' righteousness. So what is he saying? He's saying, my justification, it ain't about me. It's about Jesus. In verse 10, he talks about his sanctification. Remember, sanctification is that daily process. We said it's like the aisle leading out to the door. It's where we are constantly being saved from the power of sin in our life. Understand this, that when you're justified through faith in Christ, you are released from sin, but we like to shackle ourselves back to it. So in sanctification, we are learning every day how to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, every day to live out God's Word, every day to follow Him. It's a process, and it moves over time as we're growing to be more and more like Christ. It's like this aisle leading right out the door. In verse 10, Paul says, let me tell you what I've understood by my sanctification as I've grown in Christ. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being confirmed, conformed to his death. Paul says, let me tell you what I've figured out about this daily process in life. It ain't about me. It's about knowing him. My life is not about pursuing my wants, my desires, my happiness. My daily walk is about knowing Him more. And as I am knowing Him more, Paul says, I have learned that I have the resurrection power of Jesus Christ working in me. And the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that's working in me every day to become more like him, to know him. And as I'm being more like him, I'm working in his sufferings. What does that mean? That while it's hard, I'm being empowered by the Holy Spirit to continue to serve him and to love him. And he's working in me that I'm going to be conformed like him in his death. And what does that mean? It means Jesus obeyed God to the point of death. Death. That in my daily walk, the same power that arose Jesus from the dead is working in me to know him and grow in him. So what is Paul saying? Well, I figured out in knowing Christ that my daily life, my sanctification, it ain't about me. It's about Jesus. And finally, he talks about his glorification. That's what he said going out that doorway. Glorification is when you are saved from the presence of sin. And the only way you are saved from the presence of sin in your life is when you're face-to-face -to, -face to Jesus in heaven, right? Call that going to glory. Amen. May we all look forward to it, but not right now and not tonight. But may we look forward to its coming. So glorification is when we are saved from the presence of sin. And as we look towards that, we see that Paul says in verse 11, 
if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Do you understand that in Paul's saying here, he's not questioning his salvation. He's not questioning whether he's going to spend eternal life with God. He's not questioning that. What he's saying is, as I've gone closer to the Lord, I just understand I'm not going to take it for granted. That heaven ain't my birthright. I don't deserve it. I haven't earned it. Now, he knows that God's going to give it to him because God's always faithful. But he's not going to act like it's a birthright, like, like he is something that, that he deserves. That God in his mercy will be faithful to give it to me because of his love. The best way I can describe it to you is this. We've all got kids, right? We've all got grandkids. Now, you people with grandkids, I don't want to talk to you about your grandkids. You're crazy. Let's talk about when you had your kids, Right? What's the one thing that tears up a parent more than anything else is when you give your kids something out of the graciousness of their heart and they're not thankful for it, are they? I know your kids are never like that, so, so just imagine like it would be. And when your kids act like they've earned whatever you're giving them, like they deserve it. Now, let's be honest. Have you ever wanted to just take it back? Yes? Amen? Can I get an amen? Anybody? Am I the only one who parents like this? God, forgive me. I need to hit the altar. Pray for my children. That's what Paul's talking about. He said, I'm not going to be like that kid. Then I realize that eternal life is not about me. It's still a gift from God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And I won't take it for granted. So what is Paul saying in all this? He's saying that the greatest thing that we can ever do, the greatest thing that we can ever know is knowing more about Christ. And the more that you pursue him, the more that you gain who he is and what he is, it starts impacting everything else you see in your life. And he says, Paul says, it's even impacted my salvation, the fact that I understand that it's not about me. That I didn't save myself. That my daily life is not about me and my glory. And that my eternal life is not something that I earn or deserve. That it is because and through my relationship with Jesus Christ. And he says, the more that I focus on this, it brings humility. See, the bottom line is the more we focus on Christ, the less we think of ourselves and the more natural humility flows out of our life. I like what theologian John Stott said. He, he put it this way. At every stage of our Christian development and in every sphere of our Christian discipleship, pride is the greatest enemy and humility our greatest friend. Pride is what moves us away from all that we can know all that we can understand and who we are in Christ. But when we focus on Him, not only does humil humility flow out of us, we actually unite around the gospel because we know that the gospel is not only what changed us, it's the only thing that's going to change anybody else. Humility is the key. So as we come to the end of our passage, as we come to the end of what Paul is talking about, the question is how should we respond this evening to what we've learned? And I will tell you simply, we need to pursue humility by pursuing Jesus Christ. Pursue humility, but in essence, that's by pursuing Jesus Christ. Because out of pursuing Christ will come humility. So what does that mean to you tonight? Well, tonight, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, in pursuing humility through Christ... If you're not a Christian, you've got to accept what you already know is true, and that's that you can't save yourself. That you need a rescuer. You need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. That you need to come to God through faith in Christ because you already know there is no other way. In humility, you'll admit what you already know is true. Just a few moments, we'll have the invitation. Pastor Michael and I will be hanging up here. We'd love to tell you more about Christ. We love to tell you more about what he will do and can do and transform your life if you'll come to him in faith. Just step out from where you are. Just come speak to us. We love to have the conversation. 
Christian, for us tonight, I think we have to always keep the letter of Philippians in context and understanding what Paul is talking about. And the biggest thing about the letter of Philippians is the main thing has got to remain the main thing, and the main thing is the gospel. And the only time the gospel remains that way is when we have unity through humility. And what Paul is talking about tonight is the only way that you have humility is if you focus on Jesus Christ. Because if you focus on Jesus Christ, it eliminates pride. Pride is the enemy. Pride is what got John Ortberg onto a mechanical bull. Pride is what me and Jeff Godsell got us into a football game with the youth over the summer. Pride is not good. Humility is what keeps everything in place. So how do we pursue it? Simple. We pursue Jesus Christ. We let go of our achievements. We let go of what we think we've earned. We let go of what we think that we naturally have become. And we understand that every part of our salvation, every part of our existence, every part of our transformation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who does it, and therefore we pursue him. And the more that we pursue him, the more that we know him, the more that we understand that it's about him, and it impacts us all the way through. Humility pours out of running after Jesus. And Christian, while it's easily said, it's a choice that we have to make. Are you willing to know Christ more? That really is the question. Humility will not come unless you focus on him. So as we enter the invitation tonight, I encourage every believer to say, you know what? I want to know Christ more. I want to know him in his resurrection. I want to know him in his power. I want to know him in his sufferings. I want to be conformed in his image. I want to know him in the inside out. Lord, I'm going to pursue you. Lord, tell me what that looks like. And if you will follow him, you'll know him deeper. And humility will flow naturally. As you're praying through that, need encouragement, Pastor Mike and I will be down here. We'll be glad to talk with you. But the bottom line is each of us need to pursue Christ and allow Him to transform us from the inside out. That will help us see everything with humility.